Welcome to Spirit of Truth for this sermon on Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. And now let's join for a word of prayer. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you, Jesus, for everything that you do. We thank you, God, for our country. We thank you, Lord, for the people uh, that have leadership positions in this country who are serving you. Lord, we pray for them right now. We would ask, God, that you would, you would keep them strong in the faith and keep them strong in the principles of Scripture. Lord, we praise your name for the nation of Israel. Lord, we pray for the Jewish people, and we would ask, God, that you bring them to salvation. Lord, we would ask that you protect them from persecution, from outside forces, and from terrorism. Lord, we thank you for all of the missionaries worldwide, and we would ask, Lord, that you would protect them now, that you would allow your message to go forward through these missionaries, message that, Lord, you have come to save, that through your death on the cross, you can save people from their sins. Lord, I praise your name, and we thank you for the scriptures, the record of which is your very word. And Lord, I thank you that these scriptures are alive and at work today. In your name we pray, amen. And now let's move to the reading of the scripture. Matthew 9, 1 through 8. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Just then, some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the scribes said among themselves, He's blaspheming. But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, Why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he told the paralytic, Get up, pick up your mat, and go home. And he got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and gave glory to God who had given such authority to men. Now I'd like to argue that the main idea of these verses is as follows. In these verses, Jesus demonstrates his authority to forgive sins through the powerful display of healing the paralytic. The Pharisees and scribes were quick to judge Jesus and condemn him for claiming to be God. Yet they were stopped due to the awesome display of healing power. And now let's talk about the exegetical portion of the text. So in verse 1, we see that Matthew is following Jesus from Gadara back to his own town of Capernaum. And we get that from Mark and Luke. And all three of the Gospels are going to place this event immediately prior to the calling of Matthew, which happens in the next verses. So in verse 2, we see a large crowd gathering. And so much so that no one could actually get into the house where Jesus was preaching and teaching. Again, we see that in Mark. Luke adds that several Pharisees and law teachers had come uh, from the surrounding areas. So we've got Pharisees, we've got teachers of the law, we've got uh, tons of people. There's a big crowd gathering here. And essentially the place was full of curiosity seekers and needy people. So the paralytic's friends had to resort to extreme measures to get in to see Jesus. And so Mark and Luke record that they dug through the roof and that they lowered the friend down. And so again, what does this show? Well, this shows that the crowd was indifferent to the needs of a paralytic man. That's a problem right there. The people were so hungry to see probably a miracle or something that they, they didn't, or they just even hear Jesus or see him or something, that they were indifferent to the needs of suffering of those around them. And it also shows, though, that the friends were absolutely determined to get their friend to Jesus. Now, interestingly enough, it's actually not that hard to break through a roof in, in those ancient times. You essentially would you know, kind of climb up to the top and you'd move whatever the roof was made out of apart and you could lower somebody through. So it wasn't that difficult. It's not like breaking into a house in the modern day where it's you know essentially wood and, and roofing tile and all that kind of thing. You, know, you could break through it pretty easily. So what then happens? Well, Jesus sees the faith of the friends and he offers three comments, three expressions of comfort and joy to the paralytic. He says, first, take courage. In other words, there's a comment that something good is about to happen. Something positive is going to happen. Just take courage. Take courage. Don't be downtrodden. Things are about to change for you. He addresses him as, as my child, or some translations say my son, though it is not uh, a huios, it's not son, it's child. But it's an address of affection and tenderness uh, toward the condition. Uh, again, literally it's child, but there are reasons grammatically for the translation into son, to the, the genderizing of it. So he, he gives this, this, you know, I'm taking care of you, feeling to him. And then finally, he forgives his sin. He dismisses any guilt. And most importantly, 
There's no longer any need for any restitution for the offense. There, it's a salvific statement covering the condition of sin in every human that every human is in until redeemed by Christ. Your sins are forgiven. And it's a demonstration of Jesus' authority over fallen humankind. And there are very large implications of this, as we'll find out. In verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees immediately begin to challenge Jesus' right to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Because again, Jesus' declaration, it constitutes ultimate authority on all questions of faith and practice. In other words, when Jesus says this, it's trumping the Pharisees' teaching. They do not have the authority to forgive sins. Jesus is claiming he does. Therefore, Jesus' authority is supreme. And so what do the scribes and the Pharisees do? Well, they conclude that Jesus is blaspheming because he forgives sins. Something that, again, only God can do. And they have verse references for this. For example, let's take a look at Isaiah 43, 25. It is I who sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Very much divinity claim there. Only God can forgive sins. Psalm 103, 10 through 14. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our offenses. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. So even you have the father-child thing going on in that verse. And again, God forgiving sins. Isaiah 118. Come, let us discuss this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they will be like wool. And Jeremiah 31, 34. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know, know me, from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. Micah 7, 9. Because I have sinned against him, I must endure the Lord's rage until he argues my case and establishes justice for me. He will bring me into the light and I will see his salvation. Only God knows what's in the heart of men and, and repentance, and thus it's a divine prerogative to forgive sins. And here Jesus is doing it. This is a very clear explanation or, or uh, putting forward of Jesus' divinity. Now, Jesus then perceives the hearts of the scribes. Matthew says, knowing their thoughts. Mark says, aware in his spirit. Luke says that Jesus is aware of their reasoning. Okay? But essentially he knows what's in their heart. This is demonstrating the sensitivity of the true spirit-filled servant of God. He knew what only the divine spirit could reveal, the inner thoughts and intents of the human heart. He confronts the scribes then and says, why are you thinking evil? No, it's not confusion or misunderstanding. Why don't you understand this? Why are you misunderstood? He says, no, why are you thinking evil? Evil, demonic thoughts. Why are you thinking evil? Again, demonstrating there's no intrinsic good in man. This is an early resistance to Jesus from the leaders. And again, in verse 5, we find this question is basically rhetorical. He's displaying a supernatural power consistent with the Messiah who would heal both physical infirmities and spiritual diseases as well. So he says, which is easier to say? Forget your sins are forgiven or take up your mat and walk? Well, clearly your sins are forgiven. Why? Because your sins are forgiven. You can't. How do you check that? You can't check that. So he says, well, obviously it's going to be take up your mat and walk. But take up your mat and walk, why is it harder? Because it can be tested immediately afterward. Okay, it can be tested immediately afterward. So rise and walk is the more difficult comment. And when the guy gets up and walks, he, he did this so they would know that the sins are forgiven. In other words, the surety of one is being used to verify the other. So the healing miracle verifies the forgiveness of sins. And here's the question. If he blasphemed, well, one, how could he forgive sins? And two, where does he have the power to tell somebody to get up and walk and heal a paralytic? You see, if God's truly with him, if God is the one behind this, then he must be speaking the truth. And so in verses 6 and 7, he verifies the reality of his forgiveness through the demonstration of his healing. His intention, again, was to let them know that he had the power to forgive sins. And this was, again, claiming a divine prerogative for himself, implying that he himself was the divinity. He himself was God. And we see here again the use of the Son of Man term. It's associating now with the forgiveness of sins, and the healing is even a stronger link to the divinity seen in Daniel 7, 13-14. The Son of Man, again, is given dominion and glory and a kingdom over all peoples and nations. And Jesus' demonstration of authority over disease and sin is going to testify to that dominion. He tells the man to rise and walk. He does. Everyone is amazed. But there's no recorded response from the scribes and the Pharisees. 
Their hearts are hardened. They don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen. And so the multitudes in verse 8 were in awe and glorified God because they understood that God had given authority to Jesus. And the fear there is not terror, but awe in respect to the phenomenal power and authority that was put on display. And so let's move to the expository portion of the sermon. What we see here is sensationalism versus true spiritual concern. How often do we flock to something because of what we might get? Because, oh, it's a good sermon, or, oh, it's a good message, or, oh, it's, he makes me feel good, or, or, or whatever it is, or, oh, there's healing miracles, we'll fly here. It's just sensationalism. It's fleeing to wherever we think is going to help us next. Versus true spiritual concern, that of the friends. And the people in the audience didn't respond to the fact there's a paralyzed guy. Let the paralyzed guy through to be healed by Jesus. He's clearly healing everybody, but they wouldn't do that. And so again, even in our own hearts, we have to check this type of thinking. We cannot simply flee and go after sensationalist things. Oh, I'm going here because the Spirit's move is there. Or I'm going here because there's healing miracles there. I'm going here because there's prophecies here. I'm going here because I like their children's ministry. I'm going here because I like their music and their, their praise time. That's sensationalism. What is the true spiritual concern? Caring for those who are sick? Caring for those who are needy? Making sure they have access to the same things we have access to in terms of church and God? What about even supporting our communities in local church? And saying, you know, we could, we could just go and get fed somewhere, but maybe we need to also look to loving our communities. Again, sensationalism versus true spiritual concern. There's also the purpose of Messianic healings. These healings, when you look in prophecy, they were prophesied that they would happen around the Messiah and the Messiah would do them. Why? To validate who the Messiah is. They also are validating the Messiah's works. The Messiah has the capability to forgive sins. So he did miracles in order to validate his ability to forgive sins, to show them that this was actually a real thing. So we're getting the purpose of messianic healings in here, the fulfillment of prophecy. We're seeing demonstrations of faith in here. What was the faith? Well, again, for whatever reason, the other people did not let the paralytic in. Maybe they didn't believe Jesus would heal him. Maybe they just didn't care. I mean, either one is bad. But the friends were so convinced that Jesus would heal him, if, if only they could get in, that they found a way in. And that's a fascinating thought. That they were so convinced their faith that Jesus could heal this guy was so strong, they found a way in no matter what. And this is an interesting uh, uh, juxtaposition I want to make. When we're called to salvation, it's an irresistible thing. All of a sudden, you get this thought, feeling, spiritual concern in you that Jesus can save me. And you start trying to find him wherever you can. You find him in scripture, you find him in churches, you start seeking him out. He's seeking you. He calls you and draws you to him. And the, the person who's not, who's not born again, the person who's not saved, the person who doesn't want God, has no true spiritual concern for the gospel or for God. He simply doesn't want to search or seek out God. And so it's interesting here, when someone comes for sensationalism, they're coming for the thing and not the one who gives. Versus somebody who's got true spiritual concern is coming because they know who the person actually is and they want to be with that person. So it's very interesting to see sensationalism versus true spiritual concern. I think sensationalism is rampant in the modern American church. What about the reality and forgiveness of sins? Forgiveness of sins, when you talk to people who just got saved, it's always this sort of question. Even some people who've been saved for a long time still have this question. Am I really saved? Has God really forgiven me? Maybe I've done something too evil for God to forgive me, or maybe I've ruined my life, or I've, I've hurt other people, and so now I can never do anything, and you know my sins are basically keeping me down, and God really, can he really forgive me? And you have those existential thoughts. People do have these existential thoughts. And I think it's vital to read these verses and see that yes, God does indeed forgive. And the surety with which he forgave is the same surety that that person got, took up their mat and walked. It is certain. Your sins are certainly forgiven if you profess faith in Jesus Christ. Certainly forgiven. You are saved. You have eternal life. You have passed from wrath to grace. And what about the response from the darkness of the world? 
Well, again, we see the Pharisees here. The Pharisees are, are, are hearing Jesus. They're listening. They're disagreeing. And then they, he does a healing and forgives sins. And I want you to think about this. What should the response be? God sent his son to you to forgive your sins. And their response is, get out of here. How can we kill him? How can we get rid of him? It's a threat to their power and authority. But I want to bring this into the modern day as well. To the non-Christian. Jesus has come to save you of your sins. What about that is offensive? It seems very clear that there's only good that comes from this. There's a perfect world that's going to come. There's eternal life. There's healing. There's forgiveness of sins. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing bad. Except that there's something in the non-Christian's nature that hates God and wants to rebel. And it's irrational. There's no way to defend it. Why in the world would you want to rebel against an all-powerful, all-good, all-loving, all-knowing God? You wouldn't. But there's something in the nature. It's very clear in the Pharisees there's something in their nature where they just think evil about God. They hate God. They claim to love God. They claim to follow his laws. They claim to be, oh, we are Yahweh worshipers. How could we worship anything or anyone else? And yet the same person who says that hates the Messiah and wants to kill him. This is why it's really important when we understand today uh, people who claim to be Christians and yet have funny thoughts about the Messiah or have funny thoughts about certain aspects of things. And it's like, mm, funny thoughts with the Bible. Well, the Bible's just a human book. Really? Because you're claiming to follow Jesus Christ, but you're denying his word. And that seems very, those seem contradictory at a fundamental or core level. So the reality is the darkness of the world may look and try to look like Christianity, may try to look true like true believers, but the reality is they hate the Messiah. They would want anything but the Messiah. You get this from people who say, well, I could never, you know, I'm a Christian, but I could never worship a God who would send people to hell. Well, then you don't worship, that. you've literally just told God you're not going to worship him then. See, it's these types of things, these response from darkness, their heart's still darkened. I don't believe they're still saved. If they can make those types of comments, I think there's a serious salvific issue at heart. Now, what about the Christocentric setting? Well, again, we have the Son of Man. We have this divine, uh, divine epithet being used, Jesus of himself here. We have Christ's divinity seen through the forgiveness of sins. We have Christ's authority over the scribes and the Pharisees and their teachings. They're mere interpreters of the law. He's the giver of the law. He's the one who wrote the thing. He's the one who makes the covenants. So, you know, it's the exousia of Christ given by the Father. Christ's authority is very much on display here. And we can see that, again, in the dominance of his teachings over the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, in terms of application, uh, Jesus has the authority to forgive sins, and he has forgiven the sins of those who believe in him. The question is, what is our response? And I want to go ahead and dive into this a little bit more in depth. Our response, first, should be gratitude, thankfulness, praise, and worship. Every day. Every day we should be reminding ourselves of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. There's not a single day that goes by that, that shouldn't hit our minds at some point, and we express some form of gratitude or thankfulness to him. It should provoke us through the Spirit to repentance. And in fact, it does. We don't want to sin anymore. And so we should rely, again, on the Word of God and on the Spirit of God to lead us out of temptation and into His truth and His light and His holiness. How else? It should provoke us to want to share the gospel of people. As difficult as that often is, especially in today's environment, it is very hard sometimes to share the gospel because people just hate Jesus. They hate the gospel. I went up to people at a local university and I literally asked a person, Jesus dies for your sins so that way you could be perfect in heaven and on the new heavens and new earth for eternity with the all-loving God. What about that is offensive? The guy couldn't respond. But he, he, he didn't want it anyway. Something in him and his nature didn't want it. What's our response? Well, the born-again response is to accept Jesus. This is why you need a born-again heart because you won't accept him without it. And so we can make decisions and ask God for it, but we need that desire for God that he gives us. We need the faith that he gives. And in conclusion, I would like to say this. These verses serve as a reminder that Jesus forgives sins. As believers in Christ, we are no longer under the penalty of sin as Jesus has taken the wrath of God upon himself in our place. And so let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your death on the cross. We thank you, God, 
and we praise your name. We praise you, Lord, that our sins are truly forgiven with certainty and that we have to look forward to a life everlasting with you and the church. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church. I hope you have a wonderful day.